Today's episode was inspired by something I saw online. I can't remember where it was, but it was, who are you emotionally responsible for? And as soon as I read that, I thought, wow, that's something that's really deep within me because I have this feeling that I'm emotionally responsible for everyone <laughs> in a way. I mean, that's why I do this work. That's why I I created the Anxiety MD to help people with their emotions because on some level I feel semi-responsible, not for the pain that they've gone through, but I feel responsible for helping them heal. And that's my issue. That's my issue. And when I track back, when I really look at this at this statement, who are you emotionally responsible for? It really hit me really, really hard because I think I've been emotionally responsible for certainly my mother and my father, not so much my brother, although maybe a little bit, but my mother and my father, certainly I felt emotionally responsible for them. And I know a lot of my anxiety peeps, the people that I deal with who struggle with anxiety, have this issue with boundaries, quote unquote boundaries, which is a very commonly used word these days. Boundaries, uh, violated my boundaries or whatever, boundaries. And I think boundaries are important when you understand that you're only truly responsible for yourself. Now, when we have children, this gets a little blurry. You know, who am I emotionally responsible for? Well, you're not really emotionally responsible for your child, although it sure seems like it. It sure seems like we're emotionally responsible for them. But I think if we stay in our own garden, and this is a term that I, I use quite a bit when people come and see me and they say, you know, my mother's driving me crazy. She's, you know, going into a nursing home or whatever, and she's calling me five times a day. And I can relate to this, by the way, calling me five times a day. And, and what do I do about this? And it's driving me crazy. And, it, and, and I say, like, are you emotionally responsible for her? And immediately their response is, no, I'm not. But it's like, well, why are you acting like you are? Because there is this little concept called staying in your own garden. And I love this. Cynthia, my wife, uses this on me all the time with my mother. She says, are you in your garden or are you in her garden? And it's like, yeah, you know, I've kind of strayed into her garden. Because that was a very familiar place for me as a child to be in her garden, to be in my dad's garden, to be in their emotional business, being responsible for how they're feeling. So if my dad started to get depressed uh, and I was fearing he was going into a bipolar depression, like a manic depression, a really bad depression, I would try my damnedest to kind of take responsibility for him and see if I can make him feel better in the short term. And I was a child at the time, so of course... It, it didn't work very well. But in my mind, I thought that I, I had some power over this situation, which of course I didn't. And same with my mother. When my mother would get down, when she'd get really upset about having to deal with the, the vicissitudes of dealing with her bipolar husband, which were many, by the way. My dad pulled a number of stunts. I could do a whole podcast on just the, the stunts my, my dad pulled on the family, but specifically my mother. There was one time where... Um, my dad got a pension from from the government, quite a substantial one because uh, he had an injury while he was in the armed forces that, that may have made his, his mental illness worse. And it was a fairly significant check that they got. At the time, it was around $46,000. And at that time, my mom and dad were separated. This is close to the end of his life. And so my dad said, I'll split this with you, this $46,000. So he wrote her this check for $23,000 and some and change and gave it to her. <laughs> Sorry for laughing about this, but he, and the check bounced. And it was just, it was just so typical of the stuff that he would kind of do, like not on purpose, but there was a bit of a wry kind of, you know, passive aggressive kind of stick in there. And I remember just my mother saying, oh, the check bounced. It was just so, and that was just one of the many things that my father, the stunts, I mean, it, in a way it wasn't his fault. It was his illness. Like when he's manic, he believes that, you know, he's God or whatever. And of course, for a child, that's really difficult to deal with. But going back, I, I would feel responsible for my mother and my father. And for my mother, what I would do is I would try and make her laugh. 
So every once in a while, to this day, like she's 89 now, and she's in a, a kind of a extended care home, but she's getting better, actually. She's getting better. For those of you who follow me and you know that the the saga of my mother and, and her her uh, path to extended care. We have her in extended care place and she actually really likes it, which my brother and I are completely blown away by because she hates everything. So I would make my mother laugh and I would say whenever she'd be really down, and this is in recent years, in the last 10 years or so, my dad's been dead for like 35 years. And I would say to her, it's like, well, we could always try and cash that $23,000 check again. And every time it makes her laugh, even even when she's really feeling sick or low or whatever, and this is my little over-responsibility, I do this to her all the time, is I, I make her laugh. And I don't know if I make her laugh so much for me as I do for her, because as soon as she laughs, I know she's still in there. I know she's okay. She's not demented. Her memory is you know going, but she's not. she doesn't have dementia. But I will make her laugh. And as soon as she laughs, my nervous system just completely drops completely relaxes because that's the one thing that I know. And there was a few episodes in the last month or two where she wouldn't laugh. She didn't really get what I was saying. And plus she's deaf as a post, as my brother would say, Oh, mom is like deaf as a post these days, deaf as a post. And my brother tends to repeat himself like uh, and that way. And it's, uh, it's funny. Deaf as a post. And so I would say these things to her and I didn't know if she didn't get it because she was deaf or she didn't get it because she was just out of it. But recently, in the last little while, I, I, I made another joke about the check and she smiled and laughed. So I knew she's still in there. I knew she's still in But this is one of the things I would do because I was emotionally responsible or I felt emotionally responsible for her when I was younger. I would feel when she would laugh that would give my nervous system a little break because I knew she was still present and still stable. Like I think I saw my mom cry maybe five times in my whole life. So she's got that, those Scottish genes that, you know, never say die, you know, never admit defeat, whatever it is. William Wallace, you know, you can take my, you know, thing, but you can't take my freedom. You can't take my freedom. Anyway, so, so I would know if she laughed that she was still, she was okay. She was okay. Now, my dad was a different story because he was quite mentally ill and there was things that there was nothing I could do a lot of the time for him, which is one of the reasons I think I developed anxiety because no matter what I did for my dad, he would still go into these horribly depressed phase or these big time manic phases where he'd be awake for four days at a time. So I'm trying to understand in my current life how am I emotionally responsible for other people? One of them is when I started out the podcast today is I feel emotionally responsible for you, for your suffering, for your anxiety, because I do feel that I have a way that can help it. I do feel like I have a way that can help it. And I, ha I, I held a real grudge against psychiatry and psychologists for a long time because I saw so many of them probably between 20 and 30, maybe even more than that over the course of my anxiety career. And none of them really helped. None of them really, I mean, they helped, but they, none of them really made a huge difference for me. So I have a bit of a, a negative view of psychiatry and psychology. One of the reasons I have a negative view of psychiatry is because they couldn't really help my dad. And I think even today, if my dad showed up with his particular brand of bipolar schizophrenia, they still couldn't do much for him, even 35, 40 years later. So I have that's my own deal, is, is being frustrated with that. So that's one of the reasons why I feel kind of responsible for you, because I want you to have the information I wish I had 30 years ago that would have helped me heal or, or at least not help me just circle and get worse and worse and worse and just circle that big drain of anxiety that feels like you're never going to get out of it. So I feel kind of responsible for you because I feel like I can do something. And with my mom, I feel responsible because I can do something for her. I can make her laugh. But for my dad, I couldn't really, despite how emotionally responsible I felt for him, I couldn't really change the trajectory of his life and his suicide. So that's something that I wrestle with. But I really see, when, when I read that statement, you know, who are you emotionally responsible for? You know, I want you to ask yourself the same question. Who am I emotionally responsible for? And even your kids, you know, you're, we're not really emotionally responsible for anybody but ourselves. Now, I know that's hard when it comes to our children. 
But the more grounded we can be in ourselves, the better we can be for our kids. Because I, I have people contact me virtually daily saying, you know, my 15-year-old, my 12-year-old, my 16-year-old, my 17-year-old, whatever, is suffering horribly from anxiety. And what I usually do is I usually work with the parent first. Because a lot of times, the kids are anxious because they're reading the parent. And as much as that parent tries to hide the anxiety from them, they can still, the kids can still feel the energy from that. And that's why I did, Leandra and I did an episode of the podcast to kind of show you how a parent and a child kind of ping pong this anxiety thing back and forth. So the best thing I think adults can do first is heal themselves. Read my book. I'm, I'm coming out with a, a program in May that I'm really proud of, that I'm working really hard on right now that will help change mind, body, spirit as far as anxiety goes because I think most current therapies deal with the mind. They believe that anxiety is an issue of the mind and if we fix the thinking, we fix the anxiety, which I don't agree with because I did that for 30 years and it didn't freaking work. So I realized that to heal from anxiety, it's a combination of mind, body, and spirit. So mind, yeah, having the scientific ex explanations, knowing the amygdala, the bed nucleus of the stride terminalis, the anterior cingulate cortex, all this stuff that I know is helpful, but it doesn't heal anybody. Science doesn't heal anybody. I'm, I'm finding that out. Science won't heal you. Science will help you cope, but it won't help you heal. So there's, that's the mind part. Science part, whatever we can reduce is scientific. Then there's the body part. The body is really what holds the anxiety. Now, I could get into this whole thing that you can't separate the mind from the body, which is true. And our, the representation of our body is actually held in our mind in the insular cortex and other places. And that's a, a logical argument. I can make that. But as a construct, as helping people with anxiety, understanding that your anxiety is locked in your body is a very helpful construct for many, many people. It was for me. So it's under and then there's the spirit part, you know, the, the faith part, having faith that things will be okay, having faith in your life, having faith that things will be all right is something we lose as children. If we have, you know, a mentally ill parent or an alcoholic parent or an abusive parent or a parent that rejects us or a mismatch, a parental mismatch, you know, I, I talked to lots of people who had decent parents, but had a mismatch with those parents who didn't feel connected. And anybody with anxiety is a sensitive human being. They were probably born sensitive. And if you're born sensitive and you have a mismatch with your parents, your parents may not have been abusive or abandoning or whatever, but just because you have that mismatch with them, that's still traumatic for a child, a sensitive child. So I know I'm kind of bouncing around a little bit today, but I think it's important to just kind of give you a 360 degree view of, of this. How responsible are you for the other people in your life? So our kids, yes, in, in a way, but really it's being responsible for yourself first and foremost. And if you can be responsible emotionally for yourself and ground yourself and know how to deal with your own anxiety and heal your own anxiety, the people around you will really benefit from that. And just, I want people to really look at who am I responsible for? And how does that in, in affect my life? If you feel responsible for your partner and your partner's got a horrible situation at work, but you can't really do anything about that because you're not at work. If you can stay in your own garden and show them that you love them and you're connected to them, and you will support them, that's great. But I see so many people just getting into someone else's garden and taking responsibility for them, like I took responsibility for both my mother and my father. And it just dragged me down. It just made me more anxious because it just exacerbated this idea that I don't really have control over this other person, which I don't. Control is an illusion, especially. <laughs> Within yourself, control is an illusion. And trying to control someone else is virtually impossible. So I would just ask you in this episode of this podcast, the Anxiety Rx podcast, who are you emotionally responsible for? Now, the answer is you, you and you and you alone. That's the answer. But how does being emotionally responsible for other people in your life pull you deeper into anxiety or pull you deeper into sadness or grief or anger? 
Who are you emotionally responsible for? The answer is you. Like you're responsible for you. You're responsible for staying in your own garden. Now, this is hard for a lot of us with anxiety because we we grew up with anxiety because we didn't have good boundaries, because we were we were firm, too firmly attached to our parents, typically, uh, didn't have a lot of boundaries there. So we've transferred that into our spousal relationships and the relationships with our own kids. You know, we're, we're, we're in their gardens. Now, I'm not saying don't be connected to your spouse, to your kids. I'm just saying that you're not responsible for their emotions. You're not responsible. And I'm speaking specifically to women here because women in our society are kind of like the emotional caregivers for their families. So how responsible are you for your spouse, for your mom, for your dad, for your kids? And I just get you to really listen to yourself and just say, I, I'm only responsible for myself. Now, this is not to say you, you push them away. You say, look, you're on your own. This is not what I'm saying. I'm saying is, can you be more responsible for your own needs? If you need more help around the house, can you express that to the people in your household? You know, as kids get older, they can do more stuff. But I do see quite a few women who look after the house. They look after everything, look after the meals. They work themselves and how emotionally responsible are you for these other, the happiness or the well-being of these other people? And sometimes you are. Like when you have small children, you are responsible for them. But how much can you pull into yourself, ground yourself, and really ask yourself, how responsible am I for my spouse? How, am I, how responsible am I for my parents? How responsible am I? Who am I emotionally responsible for? It's such a great question because you really start looking at your own boundaries and your own ability to kind of say, can I be true to myself? Can I have the tough conversation with my spouse about doing more around the house? Can I have that conversation to look after my own emotional boundaries, regardless of how they react to it? And if they react poorly to it, that's staying in your own garden, letting them have their own garden. And this is what Cynthia says to me all the time when, when my mother drives me crazy is, excuse me, she'll say, whose garden are you in right now? It's like, oh, I'm in her garden. And it's like, oh, frick, Cynthia, she's always right. And it's like, can you pull back into your own garden? Because what I do notice is when you look after yourself, the other issues start looking after themselves. Maybe not right away. And this is the real pull. This is the real trick of this whole thing is because other people... When you start pulling back the emotional overreach that you have on these other people, they are going to notice it. They are going to notice that you're not doing quite the same as you used to. Maybe it's dysfunctional, maybe it's not. And they will kind of start to revolt (laughs) in some way. And they'll get upset. And when they get upset, typically, mostly female, but male too, will kind of capitulate and go, oh no, I'll still do it. I'll don't worry. But can you stay in that discomfort of staying in your own garden? And this is one of the things I had to deal with with my mother when she'd call and she'd be crying and she'd be upset or whatever. Can I stay within myself without that, without losing myself into that childhood persona persona that looked after her? Can you do this in your life? Can you ask yourself the question when you are having an emotional difficulty, a fight or a disagreement or just dividing up household duties or whatever, can you handle your own discomfort with the discomfort of others in your family? Can you handle your own discomfort when your kids get upset? Can you handle your own discomfort when your partner gets upset? Can you do that? Or are you emotionally responsible for them? Because if you're emotionally responsible for them, you'll get sucked into the maelstrom And then you guys will develop this coping, this codependent coping strategy that appears to work in the short term, but just comes at an an excruciating cost in the long term. So this episode, I know I kind of bounced around a lot, had a bit of coffee before I did this because I was just not feeling energetic. But I I hope it's provided you with some insight into asking yourself on a regular basis especially when you come up against a conflict with someone. And this is anybody. This is anybody. How responsible 
am I for their reaction? How responsible am I for their emotions? Because as a child, if you felt responsible for your parents, as I did, that bleeds into just about every part of your life. And codependent relationships, work, home, whatever, romantic, it bleeds into that too. So if you feel responsible for someone else's emotions, you're in a very precarious position. And I want you to really see that. So when you come up against conflict, how responsible am I for this other person's emotion? Ask yourself that. And really sit with the answer and make the intention that you're going to be okay with their discomfort. Because otherwise, as soon as they see that you're kind of pulling back in a way, they will get upset. And if you're responsible for their emotions, you'll just capitulate and you'll just do what you've always done. And you can't blame yourself because this is the way you're wired. But it's really important to see it. Because once you start seeing it, you may not be able to sort of do anything about it for the first 50 or 100 times this happens again. But once you start to see it, then you can start having the ability to change it. It's the old Viktor Frankl stimulus response thing. You know, in between stimulus, someone asking you for something you don't want to do or whatever, and your automatic response to do it, there is a space. And in that space, you have choice. And in that choice... Your nervous system can relax. When you know you have a choice in something, your nervous system can relax. But if you automatically and reflexively do the same thing you've always done, you're not going to be able to handle their discomfort because you are responsible. You perceive you're responsible for their reaction and you're just going to stay stuck in that whole web. And you can't blame yourself for that, but I just want you to be aware of it. Just be aware how responsible am I for this other person's emotion. And with that, I will see you next week.